Um, my name is Tom. Uh, I would like to talk to you uh, today about uh, making satellites and uh, not uh, making a single satellite, but making lots and lots of them. And before I can do that, I would like to take you to space, right? So space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing missions to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Well, as a space engineer, I can actually tell you this is a very lonely voyage, right? So the crew of the Enterprise actually had it very good, right? So every week they would meet somebody, a new civilization, a new entity in space, but actually the whole business up until now is very lonely. The reality is it is basically in business of one. A prime example of this is the International Space Station. This is probably the most complex and for sure the most expensive technical machine that we have ever built. It costs more than $100 billion and was built over a decade. And when it will be retired in 2024, right, the chances are very, very limited that there will be a machine like this. The same is true for other space projects, right? You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who, ha who have backyard telescopes. And even the professional astronomers, every mountain range in the darkness of, uh, of some remote places has telescopes. But we only have one space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. So since its launch, we have spent about $10 billion to build this telescope, to launch it, and to service it. And will there be another one? No. There's likely only this one. The International Space Station and the Hubble Space uh, Telescope are, by its definition, singular devices. And surely, for normal satellites, you know, that must be different, because there are so many of those. But no, it is virtually the same. Basically, if you take the telecommunication satellites, right? Every nation has one, so we have more than 150 of these satellites in space. However, they live for about 15 years. That means in every year, all over the world, less than 10 satellites of this type are being built. In fact, this year, only five satellites have been built. The reason is very easy. They're the size of a truck, and they cost about half a billion to build and construct. And should one of them fail, each of us here would feel the consequences. And so what do we do? We can't just really send a mechanic up there to repair it, right? Well, technically we can. So satellite services exist, but you know we have tried it and it doesn't really work. The few missions that we have done that relied on the astronauts and the space shuttle that's no longer uh, in service um, are actually much more expensive than building a new version. So each of the Hubble Space Telescope service missions cost about twice of the expected amount to make a new Hub uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So that doesn't really make sense. So until we have robotic service craft that doesn't rely on astronauts and satellites that are specifically constructed to do so, there's not much feasibility in this type of stuff. So high development costs are the status quo of the industry. These high development costs lead to a very, very small number of devices. And so if we really want to go boldly to where no one has gone before, this has to change. And to change this, I basically drew um, an inspiration from a different industry. An industry that has faced these problems before, the automotive industry. So before 1914, uh, cars were very rare. They were luxury items and only very select few, you know, mostly very rich or very noble people could actually afford a car. So they were built in very low quantities and were, were not really accessible. That all changed in 1914 when the conveyor belt production was introduced and the 
Ford T model became the first car that was manufactured on a large scale and was available for a large audience. It was produced until 1927, until today it is one of the most produced cars in the world. And you have to keep in mind, without any robots, it was produced about 9,000 times a day and the peak of its production cycle. And so what it came to this is, you start in 1914 and basically up until today, we have about 200 million cars in the United States alone and we are building about 100 million cars every year. So car manufacturing has actually come a very long way from the humble beginnings of a tool for the very few and the rich and basically it has been become something that everybody can have. So how have we get how, how did we get there? It started with an idea and the idea was for first formulated uh, by uh, by Henry Ford, which basically said in a, a bridge version, I will build a motor car for the great multitude, so low in price that no man making a good salary will be unable to own one. So that brings us back to the, to the satellites, right? So we are in a very similar system that we have one satellite where it is actually cheaper to replace than to re repair. And the, the actual uh, devices are actually not very cheap either. So with the miniaturization of uh, electronics, wouldn't it be more sensible to build these satellites much smaller instead of these truck-sized devices with wingspans of 30 meters? So can we build smaller satellites? Indeed we can. This is a small satellite that has been built by my company uh, and was launched into space in 2015. However, there's no such thing like a free lunch. So the same way that not the same amount of people fit in a sedan that f then fit in a bus, the physics physic uh, dictates that such a small satellite has not the same capabilities than has a big satellite. So. Do we really only have the chance, uh, the, the choice to either have a very, very large satellite, very expensive, very powerful, but not accessible for everybody, or smaller satellites that are lower cost, but then not really useful? No, we have other options as well. The same way that a genius can be smarter than, each, uh, than one of us, right? It cannot, this, that same genius cannot be smarter than all the people that are there. And so a constellation is basically the idea to replace one big satellite by a great multitude of smaller satellites. So essentially imagine yourself standing on a very high tower, right? The higher you build the tower, the farther you can be seen, the farther your signals reach, but the more powerful that transmitter in that tower has to be. If you have a smaller tower, you need much more towers to cover the same area. A communication satellite is essentially such a very high tower. And a constellation is a number of smaller towers, but many, many. So the idea is, why should I fly in 40,000 kilometers above the ground where there are normal, very large satellites are for communications, can I not fly them much lower and produce them in such a high number, but much smaller that itself I can replace that bigger satellites? And what would, you, what would you know? Even though we are producing such a very large number, the pure fact that we remove them from the high orbit to a low orbit makes the disposal of those satellites at the end of the lifetime much easier which means that the whole uh, problem of space debris is much more addressable. However, the business of that constellation only works if we are able to in fact produce these large number of satellites in a short lifetime. Otherwise, we have the problem that once we build the last satellite, the first satellite has already died. So let's have a look on how we're building satellites today. So let's the satellite of us in the lab. So you would need actually some kind of new technology, but this technology exists. It has been pioneered here in Berlin. 
by research institutes and small companies. The big challenge of these satellites today is that they're actually built very similar to these large satellites. So teams of about 50 people would need about two years to build one. And then you can do easily the math, the salary of these people alone would amount to about 10 million if you just build one device every two years. And if you multiply that with a large number, even though it is in itself much cheaper, it would be uh, not feasible. So what does it actually take to make such a constellation feasible? We have to reduce the build time. And we have to reduce the build time a very great deal. We have to reduce it from basically two years down to one week. By this, we can reduce the production cost, which is largely basically your salary of the engineers that do that. So we need to reduce the, uh, uh, the, the cost to build such a device from 10 million to less than 500,000, preferably to 300,000 each. That is a cost reduction by 97%. And last but not least, we need to increase our yearly production by a factor of 1,000. That sounds crazy, right? So we are trying to improve the production by a factor of 1,000, but we have to keep something in mind. 1,000 devices a year compared to the 9,000 cars that Force was able to build in one day. That's actually very reasonable because 1,000, even though it's a very large number, it is means that we only have to build 20 devices per week. So I think that puts uh, things into, into perspective. So the question remains, how do we get into space? Basically, to get into space, is made out of three distinctive things. You need to build a device, and then in order to make it work in space, you need to test and qualify it, and then obviously you need to fly it. And my company has basically managed to speed up all of these three key tasks. So we can build and assemble these, tec uh, these technologies into components that normally takes years into a matter of weeks. We can do the qualification and testing and have proven that not into a matter of six months, but we have done that in one or two weeks only to the same level of quality that the others have achieved. Well, the launch is a bit outside of our control, right? So the rocket is not what we built, but the way a, s a satellite is placed onto a rocket involves a lot of testing. If you can automate this testing, you can basically shrink down the time you have to show up before the rocket launch from a matter of months to a matter of a few hours. So thus, with these three steps, we can basically um, send more satellites to space and make it a little less lonely. The question that you might ask yourself, well, how does that affect me? Well, let's have a look into, into back into what the cars actually done, right? So the idea of Ford was I introduced the mass manufacturing to allow everybody, every one of us, to have a mobility. And so the question of the mass manufacturing from the car industry is a great inspiration for me, not only from the technical point of view, but also from what resulted from it. More than just a feature of technology, it, re, uh, um, it revolutionized the paradigm of FXS. The captains of industry back in the 20th centuries, like Henry Ford, Charles Sinder, or Howard Hughes, re recognized that mobility was and has become uh, the new gold of the 20th century. Without a doubt, their plight has revolutionized the a way we can uh, afford mobility. And, well, from an entrepreneur perspective, made them rich in the process, so that's very welcome. So, what was once only accessible for the rich and the powerful became accessible for all. Today, cars are affordable, trains are plentiful, and uh, uh, tickets for air uh, airplanes are accessible for most or everybody. 
this accessibility is a testimony of the de democratizing of the access to this mobility. And the ease which we enjoy this mobility has become a part of our everyday life. So what will be the goal of the 21st century? Most people believe it's going to be information. Information and data will make the difference whether you can participate in the, in the society or not. Whether your business will prosper, whether your nation will prosper, and so on. So the proverbs that information is king and knowledge is power basically come, become more and more abundant because of their usefulness for our everyday life. So today, big nation states and corporations spend a lot of money to invest in systems that can generate this type of data, to yield information and insight by interpreting this data and accumulating it. And so this data and this information that is generated from it allows them to have a decisive advantage. And for all of those who don't have it, it is a liability. Coming back to the satellites, these are actually tools which generate a large amount of data. They furthermore transmit a large amount of data and thus are enablers for our understanding. And so in a day and age of, you know, alternative facts and fake news, it's very important that not only a select few is able to access this type of information. So, and as long as these nations and corporations, which can afford this type of stuff, are the gatekeeper to this information, the general uh, public will have a disadvantage. So, what we actually have to do in order to democratize this data is to make the, it more accessible. And to make it more accessible, we need to make it more affordable. And with the generation of data via satellite, that means we need to make them affordable as well. And that we can do by the introduction of uh, mass manufacturing. And so we believe here in Berlin, we believe in my company, that this time has come, like it was the the 20th century to introduce mass manufacturing to cars and many other industries that became then accessible for the great multitude. To make that accessible for uh, that production as well for satellites so that all of us can benefit from that and not just a few. Thank you very much.